I'm going to start this morning talking to you a little bit about the surgical management of pancreatic cancer, uh, which interestingly is actually a minority, a small portion of the care of patients with this disease because most patients who present to the care of a physician really are not candidates to go to the operating room. I'm going to talk a little bit about the details of that. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the details of surgery and uh, how we make a decision to go to the operating room, but also outline a few things uh, that we think uh, are going to impact the care for all these patients uh, with pancreatic cancer. All right, why don't we get started? So we're going to spend the next uh, 25 minutes or so talking a little bit about uh, surgery for pancreatic cancer, which I was saying is really an option only for a minority of patients. Most patients present with advanced disease are not candidates to go to the operating room. But I'm going to outline some of the details as to how we make a decision about going to the operating room, what it is we do in the operating room, talk a little bit about the results of that, but really outline for you some things that are going on here uh, that might really impact these patients with such a horrendous disease more significantly than even the surgery piece. So uh, to remind everybody about the statistics, and Nagy said not to pay attention to the statistics, but I think it's good to have as a basis for our discussions today. So um, it is now the number four cause of cancer-related deaths in the U.S. It's the number two cause of GI cancers uh, worldwide. And uh, this year, uh, just under 45,000 patients will be diagnosed with pancreatic adenocarcinoma. And almost all the patients will die within the year of the disease, some 37,000 deaths during, uh, annually. In the state of California, we have a big population, so almost 4,000 people uh, will be diagnosed with pancreatic cancer in, the, in California. And uh, two weeks ago, there was an annual report uh, that came out looking at cancer rates over the past uh, 30 or 40 years in the United States. And one thing that's been a very interesting over the last five years is to see that a lot of cancers are, the, the, the cancer rates are dropping really for many of the majority of the most common uh, cancers. But the death rate for pancreatic cancer is one exception and it continues to rise. Um, I think over the nine years that we've been doing this symposium, uh, each year, uh, we update these numbers, and they, uh, the numbers, uh, I think, nine years ago were around 35,000 new cases each year, now up to 45,000. So overall, still, most folks are, are, are dying of the disease, but there are exceptions, and like Aggie said, we have patients here at UCLA uh, who are exceptions to that rule. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the surgery for pancreatic cancer, but I'm also going to outline some things that I think, hopefully, will um, convince you that I really think that the diagnosis and treatment outcome for these patients is going to change over the next 10 to 15 years. And there are a lot of reasons for that. So when a patient presents to our clinic, uh, we look to see how advanced the tumor is. And um, most patients already have metastatic disease or locally advanced disease. And those folks would not be helped by going to the operating room. We would just simply be exposing them to the risks of a big operation and delaying what really needs to happen for these people, and that's to be treated with chemotherapy or, and or radiation. So about 10 to 15 percent, when they come to the surgeon's attention, might be resectable. And there are a variety of things that we look at to decide whether or not they can go to the operating room. The most important study that we use is a CT scan, something we call a pancreatic protocol CT, which is a special scan that's done uh, to look at the pancreas itself. And it really has to do with the timing of when the intravenous contrast is delivered and the timing of when the images are acquired. And sometimes patients have an endoscopic ultrasound, which is another study that's done using an endoscope. There's an ultrasound probe at the tip of it, and we can get very detailed information about the tumor, uh, do a tissue biopsy to make, establish the diagnosis, and look at the surrounding structures to see if the tumor is involving those structures. We do measure something called a CA199, which is a tumor marker. 
It's the best tumor marker we have right now, but not a great one. So about 70% of patients with pancreatic cancer have an elevated CA-99. Uh, the rest of the, of the patients, the CA-99 is normal. Um, but for those that have an elevated one, it's somewhat helpful in our decision making and to be able to follow the patients. We don't often use PET or MRCP or MRI for the patients or another, another test called an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatography. Um, we don't use that. And rarely do we use laparoscopy to try to stage the patient. That means taking the patient to the operating room putting a TV camera into the patient's abdomen and taking some biopsies of anything that we think would be suspicious. So really, it's all driven by the CT scan and then sometimes the endoscopic ultrasound findings. And this is a, a, a CT showing <coughs> some of the radiological findings uh, and the things that we are looking at. Uh, this uh, <coughs> right, right here is actually the tumor pancreatic tumor, this is the contrast in one of the blood vessels, the superior mesenteric vein and the superior mesenteric artery, and we look to see the relationship of this tumor to the vessels to determine if the tumor can be removed. We think, we think that most of the time when the tumor is involving the blood vessels, those patients are better treated first by receiving chemotherapy. So patients who can go to the operating room are people that do not have distant disease because if we took out the tumor of the pancreas, then we wouldn't be taking out the rest of the tumor cells in the body. So lymph nodes that are in other parts of the abdomen that are outside of the area where we would be operating, or if those blood vessels are involved, or if there's contact to larger blood vessels in the abdomen. Largely, patients are first sent to the medical oncologist someone like Dr. Rosen who's speaking this morning to talk about treatments that can be given that will shrink the tumor or address the disease. And for some small percentage of patients, those patients can ultimately go to the operating room if we see a response to the treatment. So the operations that we do is, a, is something called a Whipple operation, an operation that many people have heard of who've been uh, diagnosed with this disease. This is an operation that involves uh, removing the tumor and the surrounding structures. We also, if the tumor is located in the tail, the body of the, of, the, of, the spe of the pancreas, we would do something called a distal pancreatectomy, which is removing the left-hand side of the pancreas. And the spleen is removed at the same time in order to harvest all the lymph nodes in that area so that the <coughs> pathologist can do an adequate sampling and be able to stage the patient for us. So this is a drawing, a pictorial of what a Whipple operation looks like. Um, and in essence, the head of the pancreas has been removed and we make a new connection between the intestine and the pancreas. Uh, we make a new connection between the intestine and the bile duct after the gallbladder has been removed. And then downstream from this, there's a new connection to the stomach so that food can flow normally from the stomach into the intestine. And this is some interoperative photos of one of Dr. Reber's operations. Just to orient everyone, this is um, the duodenum right here, the first part of the intestine. This is actually the pancreas right here. This is that vein, that superior mesenteric vein. And uh, we take special care to make sure that the tumor is not involving that vein. This is another photo showing uh, the neck of the pancreas. Here's the vein going up underneath the pancreas, and we're, Dr. Reber is getting ready to cut across the pancreas here. The portion that would be removed is all this tissue on this side. So this is the duodenum and the head of the pancreas. And this is uh, taking the blood vessels and the attachments of the pancreas off of the superior mesenteric vein and artery. And then this is the completed resection. So the vein is pulled over to the side. We're looking up towards the liver. And so this is where the pancreatic head and the duodenum used to be sitting. And then a connection is made between the pancreas and the jejunum. So this is a sewing of the cut edge of the pancreas. This is a tube that's in the pancreatic duct that helps us to try to see where the duct is and put some sutures to that to connect it to the intestine. The stent is removed before the connection, the new connection is made. <coughs> and the operation takes between four and six hours. This is sort of a completed uh, connection between the intestine and the pancreas. Um, and <coughs> Dr. Reber is getting ready to sew now the cut edge of the bile duct 
to the intestine right here. This instrument, a uh, bulldog clamp, is on the bile duct. And when the pathologist looks at the specimen, they then look to see how extensive the tumor is. And we have a staging system that allows us to try to determine how extensive the disease is and how the patient will do after the operation. We look at the size of the tumor. We look to see if it's involving the structures around it, and whether or not the lymph nodes are involved, and if there's actually evidence of metastases, the patient would be given a more advanced uh, stage. So for patients who have early stage disease, these patients are candidates to go to the operating room. But unfortunately, most patients, 85% of so patients, present with stage three or stage four disease when they come to see us. And so uh, they're not candidates for operation. So the median survival statistics, and there are exceptions to this, and I'm going to tell you some data from our place that shows a little bit different numbers. But this is generally in the published literature of what the outcome would be. So for locally advanced disease, meaning the tumors are growing into the blood vessels in the area, a median survival of about a year. Metastatic disease, again, what Aggie said, three to six months. And those who can go to the operating room, we can get pushed towards two years. But there is some improvements in survival uh, that have happened over the last 10 to 15 years for patients that can go to the operating room. This is largely probably due to better chemotherapeutics, or at least more patients who have pancreatic cancer actually receiving chemotherapy, actually getting treatment. It also is probably due to better selection. So we have better imaging. The CT scans are better. So we can uh, actually stage the patient more appropriately before we take them to the operating room. It's sort of akin to HD TV, looking at that image versus an old tube TV. And so we can see things much better and be able to characterize and categorize patients better. But um, we've had the chance to look at the most recent results uh, of the patients of, that were resected at UCLA. And right now, in these patients, highly selected group, all of which are getting treatment afterwards with chemotherapy, the five-year survival is approaching 35 percent. So if you think about where we were in the mid-1990s or before that, when the survival rates in the literature were between 12 and 17 percent, in many ways, over the last 10 to 15 years, we've doubled the survival for patients who can go to the operating room. So this is a great thing. Another thing that's really important when we go to the operating room is to be careful and not lose a lot of blood. And in fact, it's interesting, patients who have limited blood loss during the operation actually do much better after the surgery with regards to the survival uh, after the operation, even cancer-specific survival. So, uh, for patients who have less blood loss, uh, they seem to do much better. And so we can push up towards 40% survival rates when we have minimal blood loss. That probably has to do with uh, the, the, the extensiveness of the disease. It has to do with um, whether or not they need a blood transfusion. Giving a blood transfusion can sometimes suppress your immune system. And so that might impact on the likelihood of the patient having a recurrence after the operation. There are all sorts of new uh, ways to do pancreatic surgery. And this is some photos of doing uh, robotic, assisted, and laparoscopic uh, pancreatic resections. And there's a lot of discussion and activity happening in the world of surgery about converting uh, pancreatic surgery over to this type of approach. Uh, it's basically the same operation that we would do with an incision, but we use a TV camera or a robot to help us do it. In most of the distal pancreatectomies, the tumors that are on the left side of the pancreas, we do those laparoscopically at UCLA. Um, but ultimately, it probably the technique in which we are doing the operation doesn't really ultimately impact the outcome of the patient with regards to their survival or whether or not uh, they'll have a long-term durable effect of the operation. Um, so we are uh, across the country and in Europe, there's been a lot of excitement about this and we're doing that here at UCLA. But in the big scheme of things, when you think about that there are almost 45,000 patients each year diagnosed, this type of technology isn't going to really move the, the ball down the field significantly. 
One thing we do know is it makes a difference if you get your pancreas operation done at a place where there are a lot of those cases done. And uh, Dr. Reber and the pancreas, pancreatic surgical group often say, well, it's not particularly because of our ability, our technical ability in the operating room, but it really has a lot more to do with the group think that comes when you have a large group of clinicians who are caring for pancreatic cancer. Uh, we have a multidisciplinary conference that meets every week. Barbara Clerken is our nurse coordinator, and she does a great job at pulling together all the thoughts of all the different specialties that are involved in caring for these patients, medical oncology, gastroenterology, radiology, pathology, radiation oncology, surgery, uh, pathology. Everybody's there in these conferences, and it makes a difference. It's a complex disease, um, and it makes a difference in the outcome. And there's actual data that now shows that it makes a difference. When you have a group that's focused on that, patients' outcomes are better. I've shown this slide a couple of years. Uh, it remains the case um, that we could do uh, something right now about pancreatic cancer, and that is for patients who have disease that actually could be removed, that we think is resectable, that we think is uh, limited to the pancreas or some of the lymph nodes in the area, if we would just recommend and have them go to the operating room, we would impact uh, the outcome of this disease as a whole. Right now in the United States, 50% of patients with resectable pancreatic tumors, stage one disease, are never referred for surgery. Why is that? Well, you think, why, how could that be? Well, I think for a long time, uh, everyone in the community and the physicians caring for these patients, rightfully so, has thought that this is a lethal disease. And so when the diagnosis is made, then the patient needs simply to get their affairs in order. Uh, and that there's no options. And that's just really not the case. If we could just have these groups of patients pushed uh, to pancreatic centers across the country and be evaluated, that would really impact the outcome of, of, of a, a large segment of the patients with new diagnoses. And it makes a difference. This is a slide showing the outcome of patients who had a pancreatic surgery, uh, um, who had stage one disease, much better compared to if you had stage one disease and didn't have surgery, the outcome's much worse, and equal to that as if you had metastatic disease. So going to the operating room for early disease makes a difference. This is some information about our disease center. We see a lot of patients at UCLA with pancreatic uh, diseases <coughs> and pancreatic cancer and the good survival numbers that I talked about. So, there's some optimism, but as we all know, um, it's still a very difficult disease to treat for most patients. And um, we currently don't have a test to detect this that's very reliable. The chemotherapies have not been particularly effective, although there's been some movement on that over the last two to three years. Radiation is not particularly useful. Surgery is safe. We can offer a, offer a safe operation, but that's only for a minority of patients. And it's interesting to note that in the United States or really throughout the world, there's never been a phase three trial, which is a more advanced type of chemotherapy trial, to look at the use of giving chemotherapy before you would go to the operating room, which is so common for other types of cancers like breast disease and gastric cancer and rectal cancer. So we have a lot of work to do. What we need to do right now is when we see patients, this is Dr. Goh's slide, but when we see patients, we see patients that have uh, really advanced and metastatic disease way out here on the curve. And what we need to do is move this line to the left-hand side of the slide to where the patients either have locally advanced disease or even disease like uh, pre-cancer type lesions. So that has happened in breast disease, something called DCIS, patients who have DCIS can get prophylactic treatment so that the patients don't go on to form cancer. So I think that the treatment and the evaluation of pancreatic cancer will go the way of other epithelial basin malignancies like gastric cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer, prostate cancer. Uh, we will make great progress as we begin to have better detection and better ways to identify these patients early. I'm going to outline a few uh, exciting things that are going to happen on the science side that I think are going to make a big difference 
here at UCLA uh, for what ultimately we all want, and that is the cure of the disease. It wasn't until the early, uh, well, it was 2001 that we even knew how pancreatic cancer formed. So we're really behind the curve as compared to other, uh, other cancers. Uh, but in 2001, everybody who was doing pancreatic cancer research began to coalesce around the concept that pancreatic cancer starts from the ducts of the pancreas and that there was a series of genomic, uh, genetic changes that happened that ultimately uh, resulted in the formation of cancer. And what's really exciting is that for the first time over the last five to six years, there have been this really tsunami of new data uh, and investigators, scientists across the country who are doing really high quality work. We would never see a publication about pancreatic cancer in a journal like Science or PNAS or Nature Medicine. And now it happens with some regularity and it is going to transform this disease. Um, we do know and have learned over the past uh, few years uh, that there are certain uh, risk factors to the formation of pancreatic cancer. There are certain genetic abnormalities, uh, environmental factors, and so people are looking into these areas and beginning to investigate them. One of the research groups here at UCLA uh, who is part of the pancreas research group uh, Dr. David Wong and the School of Dentistry and Dr. James Farrell with gastroenterology has been looking at the use of the saliva to be able to detect pancreatic cancer. And they have some pretty interesting data. Um, they looked at the RNA, which is a type of genetic marker in the saliva, to try to differentiate patients who had no cancer to those who had pancreatic cancer and were able to come up with a panel of markers that had a very significant uh, sensitivity and specificity for detecting pancreatic cancer. They think that uh, the pancreas, when there's a cancer, actually secretes little vesicles or exomes that ultimately are shed through the saliva, and they're able to detect this with uh, molecular techniques. And so now they're doing a much larger trial looking to see if we can validate that and try to ultimately be able to detect patients with this disease much earlier. Right now they're targeting people that have abnormalities uh, in, on a CT scan uh, or who have abnormalities uh, seen on some other type of imaging to try to see if we can make a, a diagnosis. So this is a very exciting area uh, and potentially could be as transformative uh, uh, event for patients with this disease or who might be at risk for it. There's a lot of work being done at, at, to improve imaging so that we can have higher resolution and detect uh, disease. This is a 3D reconstruction of a pancreatic tumor <coughs> and the vessels around it. Uh, James Tomlinson, who's a, medical, a surgical oncologist here at UCLA, has been using special antibodies that can target pancreatic cancer and using a PET-CT can identify lesions. And this is some of the mouse work that he's been doing the other potential for this type of technology is to attach treatment to these antibodies so that it could target the tumors themselves. Uh, so we hope that with time we'll have better imaging. There's no doubt that neoadjuvant therapy is arriving. I'm going to let Dr. Rosen talk more specifically about that. But I think it will become standard of care that most patients will get neoadjuvant treatment or treatment with chemotherapy before surgery before they go to the operating room. Of the phase two trials, if you look, uh, uh, that have been done for neoadjuvant treatment with pancreatic cancer, patients who had locally advanced tumors who were treated with GEMSAR or 5-FU, a fair number of them were able to ultimately go to the operating room, about a third. And for those who did go to the operating room, the median survival was equal to those who ultimately, who initially had a resectable lesion. So, Treating patients with locally advanced tumors with chemotherapy before we go to the operating room makes a difference and allows them to ultimately be able to have surgery which impacts their survival. Um, what the right and most effective regimen is, we don't know yet, but it does seem to have a lot of promise. At UCLA, uh, we've had the opportunity to present some of the work that Dr. Reber and Isaacoff and Donahue have done looking at the use of neoadjuvant treatment. Uh, looking at some 40 patients who received a combination of drugs, 
5-FU, leucovora, and mycotomycin C, and dipyrimidol. And these patients ultimately were taken to the operating room. This is a patient, you can see the tumor right here, and then after treatment, the tumor got smaller. And the patients who went to the operating room, 83% uh, of them were able to have their tumors removed. And the survival is really uh, quite remarkable. If you look at the survival curve, the median survival of this group of patients is 52 months. So that's really very impressive. It's a very highly selected group of patients. Uh, and we don't know what the right uh, combination of drugs is, but it is uh, the future, and I think uh, provides great promise uh, for patients with this disease. Uh, the most common chemo that we've been using for pancreatic cancer is something called Gemzar or Gemcitabine. And Dr. Donahue and uh, researchers in uh, the uh, radiology department have been using PET-CT to be able to predict if a patient is actually going to be responsive to gemcitabine. About 10% of patients have a great response to gemcitabine, but overall it's not such a great drug. And if we could figure out those who are going to be responsive to it, then they could be targeted with that drug. And so they have developed a probe, a PET probe, that actually is very much uh, metabolized like gemcitabine. And they've been able to show that those patients who have a specific enzyme uh, that metabolizes uh, uh, gemcitabine, uh, those who have this enzyme activates the drug, uh, do much better if they're treated gemcitabine than those who don't. And if you could figure that out with PET imaging, who had the enzyme and who didn't, uh, you might be able to use it as a targeted agent. This is just some of their mouse work that shows that mice that were treated with uh, gemcitabine who had the enzyme had much uh, better survivals than those who did not. So they've actually started studying patients and have had six patients who have been scanned now uh, and are able to demonstrate in those patients who have activity that uh, they have this enzyme and might be great candidates to have gemcitabine. So we'll be able to target uh, the at least currently available chemotherapeutics for patients with pancreatic cancer. Another group at UCLA, Dr. Brunicardi, is looking at the use of targeting a specific oncogene, uh, which is uh, an important uh, factor in the development of, pancreatic can of, of the pancreas and potentially pancreatic cancer. He's shown that this is overexpressed in patients with, uh, patients with pancreatic cancer and, and mice, and he's currently beginning a trial uh, using a specific molecule that targets this oncogene to try to improve patients' outcomes. So there's new potential for therapeutics, and there are a lot of excitement uh, now with targeted treatments being used in early phase trials for pancreatic disease. And then we're going to have a talk in a few minutes about prevention, but I just wanted to mention Dr. Rosengert's work, which is focused on the uh, use of metformin. Metformin is a diabetic drug uh, that's been used for many years uh, to treat diabetes, but there's interesting epidemiologic evidence that for patients who have diabetes and are treated with metformin, uh, they have a 60% lower incidence of the formation of pancreatic cancer. And for patients who have cancer and are on metformin, they actually have much better outcomes. And so he's investigating the signaling events that occur in the pancreatic cancer cells and trying to understand how metformin is working uh, in, in this disease and has shown in animals that uh, when you put human tumors in animals that uh, treated with metformin, tumors grow slower and the animals have a better outcome. So we know now that uh, pancreatic cancer forms from ductal epithelium. Uh, there's been a lot of progress in understanding the genetics of this and the processes that occur uh, to ultimately form pancreatic cancer. And you might imagine that if we could identify patients who have precancerous lesions, you could do preventative <coughs> treatment. Diane Harris is going to talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to mention some of the work that Dr. Eibel is doing, looking at the, at the role of diet and how this impacts the progression of, 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 uh, through these early uh, lesions to pancreatic cancer. This is some data from his <coughs> work showing that in mice that spontaneously form pancreatic cancer, they were fed a high-fat, uh, high-calorie diet. There were many more of these advanced precancerous lesions as compared to animals that were fed a more normal diet. So he has a large research group and project that's investigating that. 
So we know that pancreatic surgery is safe. Uh, we know that it only impacts right now a minority of patients. But I think as we begin to have earlier diagnosis, we'll be seeing earlier lesions, and so surgery will become even more important. It will become more important when we have more effective chemotherapeutics to treat uh, patients preoperatively before they go to the operating room. And so the indications for surgery, I think, will expand as we begin to have better diagnostics for this disease. Um, the areas that I think <coughs> we need to focus on, of course, which have already been stated, and that is early detection, improved imaging, the use of chemotherapy before surgery, molecular profiling, and obviously prevention strategies. So I thank everybody for the opportunity to speak with you today.